Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Friday Halaqa at Abu Huraira uh, in Toronto. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa ba'du. Today, inshallah, we are move on to Surah Al-Hijr. Surah Al-Hijr, which is Surah number 15, in the Mus'haf, in the Mus'haf that we have, it is uh, Surah number 15, and it, in order, in the order of the Mus'haf, it's after Surah Ibrahim. Uh, Surah Al-Hijr was revealed in Mecca, and it was revealed after su- the revelation of Surah Yusuf. Uh, the verses of Surah Al-Hijr are 99, and Al-Hijr, uh, Al-Hijr it actually refers to the, to the area uh, where the people of Thamud uh, lived, uh, the people to whom Prophet Saleh was sent, because there is a mention of them in the surah, and they are an example of people who disbelieved in the truth. So what is the surah about? The surah starts, actually, the, um, I would say in the first two verses, there is a clear indication as to what the surah talks about. It talks about the Quran itself and that it contains the truth in so much clarity. And then it shows the rejection, the denial of the disbelievers. And it refers in a very subtle but beautiful way to their end on the day of judgment. Like what is going to happen to them? What is, what's going to be their state on the day of judgment? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are the verses which are signs of the book, the Quran. Uh, and there's two references to the Quran here, Kitab, the Quran in the form of written, and Quran in the form of being recited. And this happened, it happened actually, um, it happened in Surah An-Naml. Surah An-Naml is the opposite order. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilki ayatu al-Qur'ani wa kitabin mubin. Here, Tilki ayatu al-kitabi wa Qur'anin mubin. It refers to the Qur'an. And there are some people today who are trying to differentiate between the Qur'an and the Kitab as if they refer to do two different things. And this is opposed to what we know from uh, the tafsir that we was handed down to us from the companions of the Allah anhum, from a tabi'in, the people who understood the Arabic language. But it's just a modern kind of a trend. Some people are, uh, and a lot of them are following one person who died a couple of years ago, who was just uh, reading into the Quran a lot of nonsense. Um, so they try to say the kitab is something and the Quran is another thing. But the reality is, no, it's actually... It refers to the Quran in two different senses, and there is a there is a reason why it's mentioned kitab, and sometimes it's mentioned uh, Quran. We said kitab is more about the written format, and Quran is more about be about it being recited. Uh, but the point here is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is highlighting the signs, which are the verses of the Quran that they are signs. They contain the truth. They point to the truth so clearly. Mubin. That's the word mubin with so much clarity that leaves no doubt. Then Allah SWT says, رُبَّمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ In other قِرَاءَاتِ رُبَّمَا يَوَدُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ كَانُوا مُسْلِمِينَ So Allah is here is referring to the state of the disbelievers on the Day of Judgment, that they wish they had been believers, or they wish they were believers in the dunya. So Allah is saying the Quran, and the signs of the Quran or the the verses of the Quran, they clarify the truth without any need for further clarification for those who are searching for the truth. Those who act in denial to this truth and they live their life in denial, eventually they will come to a point where they will regret that. And they, at that time, they would wish they had been believers. Then Allah, and, and if we look at the surah, we can actually divide the surah into five segments. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first talks about how the disbelievers respond and, and, and how their disbelief and their arguments. So Allah talks about their 
psychology, their behavior a little bit, and what's going to happen to them. Uh, and Allah shows, traces back their disbelief, not be because of lack of mental condition, of mental conviction, or lack of proof, or lack of evidence that points to the truth, but it is uh, a decision that they arrived at, at, um, at a deeper level, and that's denial and rejection of the truth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points to his signs in the creation. So Allah puts that in context. And Allah shows how their response to the truth does not go with the real context of life. So Allah points to how he created the world, how he created the heavens, uh, the, the, the earth, about his blessings and how Allah designed the world in perfect harmony for a specific purpose and reason. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us back in human history where Allah traces the origins of all of this back to the story of the creation of Adam alayhi salam and how Iblis, how Satan, uh, or Satan's attitude and response to the creation of Adam and that this is actually, this explains the disbelief of the disbelievers. They fell into you know, the plan or the plot of Satan, of Shaitan, and that's why they are disbelieving. So their arguments on the surface are not real arguments. They are just rationalizations and justifications. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, Yeah, so since Allah mentions the story of the creation, he mentions how everything is going to happen that the disbelievers will end up in the hellfire, the believers will end up in paradise. There's a short description of what's going, what they're going to enjoy in paradise. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an example of stories of people who rejected the truth and they rejected the prophets. Uh, highlighting uh, the people of Lut here. And... Um, Obviously, Prophet Ibrahim is involved in the story. So the, the reference starts with him talking about the people of Lut and how the punishment was going to come to them. Uh, then, obviously, there is a reference to, uh, again, Ashab al Aika and Ashab al Hijr. Uh, all of these are, are people who received messengers, but they uh, responded with denial and uh, disbelief. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, puts a beautiful closure to the surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he, we created the heavens and the earth not in vain, but for a purpose. In truth, here means for a purpose, for a wise purpose. Everything is purposeful in the universe. There is intention behind everything and everything is just unfolding according to divine plan that is going to bring uh, ultimate goodness. Uh, Yes, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closes the surah with this reference to the Qur'an containing the truth and emphasizing the evil end of the disbelievers and encouraging the Prophet sallallahu and consoling him to remain upon the truth and put up with all of this resistance and not to be dissuaded by uh, all of the negativity of the disbelievers. Um, so let's take the first part. So we said that we can divide it into five parts. The first part covers the first 15 uh, verses in Mus'haf al Medina. It covers the first page of the surah. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these are the uh, verses which are the signs of the Quran, which are very clear and very indicative of the truth. Uh, perhaps, or most likely, or evidently on the day of judgment. Allah is referring to the Day of Judgment here as if it already happened because it's a fact, it's going to happen that the disbelievers would wish they had been Muslims, that they had accepted the truth. So meaning don't let their arrogance and their uh, false facade now, don't let that you know, deceive you. Allah says, uh, let them eat and enjoy themselves and let their false hopes keep them you know, distracted they shall come to see for themselves. They come, shall come to see, uh, to know the truth for themselves. And Allah says, and we only destroy people when their appointed time comes about. 
everything has been already scripted, inscripted and planned. And they would say, uh, all you who received the revelation, you are insane, you're out of your mind. Again, don't, don't just take that seriously. Uh, and they would say, why don't you bring angels with you? Then we would believe Allah says, we send the angels for specific tasks and that's the only time we send them. Um, so the angels have a specific purpose and they are going to fulfill that purpose. They're not, we're not here just to respond to these wishes. Again, they are false wishes and arguments of these disbelievers. Then Allah says about himself that it is we who sent down the dhikr, the remembrance, which is the Quran revelation. And Allah says, and I'm going to preserve it. So this is how we know this. There's consensus among the Muslim scholars that this verse refers to the Quran, that it will be preserved. It's revealed from Allah. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it will be maintained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's maintained in word and meaning. That's the meaning of hifz, preservation. Because if you preserve the words without the meanings, then what's the point? Because the Quran is the words and the meanings. So it's preserved. So this is why uh, anyone who comes comes up today and they say, uh, you know, yeah, the Quran was preserved in terms of words, but meanings, you know, those understandings of the early generations, a, a lot of the understandings from the Prophet ﷺ were dropped, were not handed down, etc. We know this is not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to preserve the Quran and the Quran includes the words and the meanings, and these are preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says then that what you are facing is not something new. We have sent previously, you know, to previous nations. And every time a messenger comes to them, they start mocking their messengers, making fun of them. And Allah says, this is how we make the hearts of the disbelievers, of the criminals. This is how we make them behave. This is how we, we allow them to behave in this way. They don't believe in it, although they've seen, they've seen the truth and the news of previous nations came to them. And Allah then shows the reality of their false arguments when they say, oh, why don't you bring a sign? Why weren't angels sent down with you? Allah SWT says in verse number 14, Allah says, had we opened the gate in the skies, and they could ascend through the gates to see. See what? See the upper world, see everything, see the angels, see paradise, see the hellfire, everything that they are promised and that they are informed about in the revelation of the Quran. What would their response be? They would say, oh, this is delusion. This is like, this is optical illusion. You know, this is magic. This is deception. We're definitely under the spell of some kind of magic. That's what they would say. Why? Because they already have adopted an attitude of denial of the truth. So, oh, Muhammad, don't think that when they ask you for signs that they're actually serious. Don't think if they see signs that they would actually believe. This is why sometimes Muslims say, you know, if Allah just gives a sign and people would believe, the reality is no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another place in the Quran, Allah says about the people of disbelief. On the day of judgment, they wish, they would actually wish they would go back to the dunya so that they could believe. And Allah says, Had they been sent back to earth after seeing the whole day of judgment and everything, seeing the truth for themselves, had they been sent to the dunya, they would also disbelieve. They would do exactly what they did. That's to show you belief is not a matter of mental conviction. But all of these mental arguments or seemingly logical arguments are actually just rationalizations, justifications of an already adopted attitude of disbelief. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, we move to the second sort of segment in the surah. In verse number 16, where Allah talks about, Allah draws our attention to his favors, to his blessings, to his magnificent creation of this world. How it is so orchestrated, so organized, so beautifully laid out. And there is a subtle message here that 
such a, an organization is meant for a purpose. It, it's, that's the only way to make sense of it. So Allah says that we have, uh, uh, so, so Allah is referring to the creation of the, of the heavens uh, and how he beautified the skies and how Allah protected the skies from shayateen who are trying to listen to the commands that are given to angels, etc. And then Allah says, and we have spread the earth. We have spread the earth. So you can travel through it. You can benefit from it. And we made some of it flat, which is spread, and some of it mountains, mountainous areas. Uh, and we have caused balanced creation, balanced plantation to come forth from it. And, and this shows that actually natural vegetation has maintains its own balance. So there is a balance in the natural creation. And also there is balance in the food cycle. It's, so it's a whole ecosystem, divine ecosystem. And it also the food that it provides is actually a balanced balanced nutrition. And we have made your provisions come from the earth. We made it the source of your provisions and it's the source of provision for other creatures that you could not provide for. Allah says everything in existence, the treasures of that, the source of that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah only sends down you know, things according to a measure. So there's nothing random in what Allah gives, what Allah withholds, what Allah allows to grow. Everything is measured according to the divine plan because everything serves a purpose. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not create anything without a purpose. Allah does not bring anything if it's not purposeful. So everything is intended, every detail in this world and in the creation. And Allah then refers to the wind, how the wind causes the pollination of plants and it also the wind cause moves around you know the 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 steam or the vapor and and, and the water that evaporates and how the 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 movement of wind causes the clouds to form in certain ways and then send down rain and Allah says so he sends down rain and you cannot control that rain you cannot just store it and think you can you know just keep it, it the, there's a water cycle there's a system but you can only benefit from that water cycle or that natural system and Allah says we are the ones talking about himself this is a royal we who give life and take life life and death and everything returns to us Allah is going to inherit everything. Everything's go everything came from him and everything is going to return to him. And Allah says, we, we know the people who came before and the people who will come after. Everything is under control with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, eventually all of you will be brought to Allah on the day of judgment. Indeed, he is wise and he is strong in judgment and he is knowing. So again, this provides context for our life and what we are supposed to do, do here. And it shows that the response of the disbelievers and their denial is actually something out of context. And here we move to the third uh, segment in the surah, starting with verse number 26. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the creation of humans. Allah says that we created humans from clay and the jinn, we, Allah says we, he created them from fire. And Allah said to the angels that I'm going to create a human being from clay. So when I make him, shape him, form him, and blow the soul into him, you know, prostrate in his direction. The angels obeyed the command, they prostrated, but Iblis, Satan, refused, was from the jinn, right? And Allah questioned him, why did not you prostrate? Now, Iblis, Satan, is not from the angels, but he was in the company of the angels because he was worshipping Allah at the time. And when the command came, it came to the angels and everyone who was in their company. It doesn't mean Iblis is from angels. He's not an angel. He's from the jinn. So Allah questioned him why he did not respond to the command. He said, you know, I'm not going to prostrate to something you created from clay. 
basically like arrogance. I'm better than him. I come from a better source, better material, whatever it is. Again, who told uh, Satan that fire is better than clay? And even if this was the case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates created humans from clay. How do you know that the final product is lesser than you? You don't know. This is obviously, again, it's just arrogance which blinded uh, Satan. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, this is a, an attribute of Allah. This kind of pride can only be true in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he's the only one who stands in no need of anything or anyone. And he's self-sufficient. But whereas creatures are all dependent on Allah. So they have no right to pride. So if someone, one of them is, is, is prideful, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then you have disconnected yourself from my mercy. You're cursed out of my mercy. Until the day of judgment. So shaitan was, he, he sort of, accepted that he went with that as opposed to admitting his mistake and re mistaken repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah is warning us against this and Allah is showing again look at the argument of shaitan there's no logic really in the argument that you know I'm created from fire I'm better than he I'm better than him or he's created from clay there's no point here but the reality is there was there was something else inside and this is just a rationalization justification so the reality of shaitan, what he chose to be, Allah brought that outside. Allah brought that to the surface. So he says, oh Allah, keep me alive till the day of judgment. Allah said, I'll keep you. Because Allah is going, Allah tested shaitan with humans, with Adam. Allah is going to test humans with shaitan as well. Until the day of judgment. And shaitan said, I shall take all of them astray, except for those who really choose you, the pure ones who end up choosing you, oh Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my servants, you have no authority over them. You cannot tarnish their beauty. You cannot uh, pollute their, their pristine, beautiful you know, nature when they choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they choose the truth. And Allah says, whoever follows you, then they will go with you to the hellfire. Because the, the criterion with Allah is good and evil, truth and falsehood. That's it. Because Allah himself is the truth. Anything that is disconnected from the truth is falsehood. And it's evil. Anything that's connected to Allah is good. If it's disconnected from Allah, it's evil by definition. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept falsehood and evil. And where does that belong? It belongs in the hellfire. That's where it goes. And this is why humans are given the choice. Allah says, uh, their appointment, those who choose other than the truth, those who insist on falsehood, well, their appointment will be the hellfire, Jahannam. It has seven gates, and they will have, you know, enter, um, like entering gates or sub-gates within each one of them. But as to the believers, those who embrace the truth of what Allah created, the, that, that Allah created them upon, and they choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these people will be in gardens and rivers, and they would enter it in peace and security, and Allah would remove all you know, hard feelings from their hearts, from their chest. There's no negative feelings in Jannah. There's no negativity, there's no pain, there's no sadness. It's just pure bliss. That's what's going to be in, in, in paradise, in Jannah. And they would be upon, uh, you know, their beds and their couches facing each other because they're enjoying the company as well of each other. There will be no physical fatigue as well, no physical negativity, no psychological, emotional negativity, no physical, you know, fatigue or tiredness or suffering or pain or whatever. And they will never be taken out of it. That's it. There's eternity in that beautiful bliss. Then we have uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the end of, I would say, segment three. And we, now we can move to segment four. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about stories of some previous nations and how they disbelieved and what happened to them. That's a lesson. That's a wake-up call. But Allah, before that, he makes a reference to himself. And he 
commands the Prophet to tell humans about their Lord. Tell my companion, my tell my my creatures, my servants that I am forgiving and I am merciful. That's who I truly am. If you choose me, that's what you get. But if you choose falsehood, the punishment of Allah is severe. And the choice is yours. When Ibrahim, now Allah here start, mentions the story of the angels where they came to Prophet Ibrahim السلام, in the form of men. He offered them food and they didn't eat from it, and they gave him the uh, you know the good news of a son being born to him. Uh, although he was old age, his wife was old age. And then they came to tell him the news that they were sent to destroy the people of Lut because Lut followed Ibrahim and he became a messenger as well. But his people were resisting the truth. They were choosing falsehood and, and immorality, disbelief, kufr and filth. And they decided to live this way. So they said, that's it. The command has, divine command has come that these people will be destroyed and we shall just save uh, Lot, the family of Lot, and the believers among among his people, his family, the believers among his family as well. When they came to Lot, alayhi salam, these angels, he he was again, he was petrified, he was scared because he was still concerned for his people, hoping for their guidance. But eventually, they gave him the news that you know you'll have to leave early in the morning because the oh, in, at night because these people will be destroyed in the morning. And at this time, his people approach, they see some strangers and they want to practice with them again, the, their evil. And you can see how obsessed they are, they were with this. Uh, so, uh, so eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the morning they were destroyed, these people. And they would remain a sign for for subsequent generations. And then Allah refers to Ashab al aika and Allah talks about Ashab al-Hijr, and we said al-Hijr is uh, the place where Thamud, uh, the people of Salih, lived, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we sent our signs again, that point of the truth, but they turned away from them. Allah mentioned some of his blessings upon them and how they act in denial and ingratitude. Allah eventually says, They were destroyed, and whatever they possessed, whatever they made, that did not protect them. It did not make them immune against the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we move to the final section in the surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts all of that in context, specifically the creation. Starting with verse number 85, Allah says, we have not created the heavens and the earth except in truth. And what is this truth? This truth is Allah brings the beauty of, Allah brings his expression of his divinity and his beautiful names and attributes out onto the, onto, on the creation. And that's the source of all good. That's the source of all truth. So that's the truth. That's the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth for, which is his names and attributes, his beauty comes to expression on the creation. And Allah says, And the hour is going to come. We're going to restore all the balances, right? All the wrongs. So, you know, don't, uh, sort of overlook them, overlook look all of these problems and issues and rejection, etc. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a reference to the Quran, how it's great. And he consoles the Prophet ﷺ, directs him to focus on, you know, what brings him closer to Allah and not be attracted or deluded by the surface blessings of the people of disbelief, how they are. They seem to be getting the blessings of Allah, right? But again, this is, this is not the point because the uh, Prophet ﷺ said, had this dunya really was worth a wing of a mosquito, Allah would not offer a disbeliever of it even a sip of water. But again, this dunya is just a test. So if someone has got the dunya, someone is enjoying it, it's not a sign whether they, that they are upon the truth or not. It's irrelevant. Uh, and Allah, there is the Prophet to convey the message and 
Allah, Allah says that these people turned away from the truth, from revelation, from the Quran, and we shall ask them. We shall hold them accountable on the day of judgment for you, O Muhammad, convey the message, announce it so like strongly with 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 heart and and with clarity and 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 with courage and turn away from those who associate partners with allah we have those who you know try to make fun or mock you we have protected you from their harm and we know that it really causes your your chest to be constricted negative feelings just because of opposition because of the denial of the truth etc and also because the prophet ﷺ wanted good for them but they were rejecting it uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophet ﷺ to focus on you glorify the name of your lord and be among those who prostrate who worship before allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worship allah until death comes to you Fulfill your mission and don't be distracted by those people. As simple as that. Because eventually we go back to the beginning. On the day of judgment, these people would wish they had been believers. That's the end of the story. You can't guide them if they don't choose to be guided. And that's that's the end of the story. So the, the Surat Al-Hajr is about the truth of the Quran and how it clearly conveys the truth and how it's rejected by the disbelievers and not for the right reasons and not for the reasons they communicate and not for their rational, seemingly rational arguments. There's something underneath and that the end is going to be that they will figure out that they were wrong. Simple as that. So I hope this gives us some, uh, like a good glimpse into Surah Al-Hajj. It's a beautiful surah. Um, and inshallah next week, or next uh, session, probably, yeah, so Ramadan is 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 round the corner, so I'm not sure if we will continue with Surah Al-Nahl or we will keep this for later on. We'll see, inshallah. Let's give it a thought and bi Allah ta'ala we'll let you know next Friday. Jazakumullah khairan for joining us. And uh, a reminder to benefit from the month of Sha'ban, uh, do more righteous deeds, establish your relationship with the Quran, or with Salah a little bit more, with the with fasting a little bit more in preparation for Ramadan um, and uh, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes Ramadan uh, like a time for getting closer to him and for uh, pleasing him and uh, earning more of his blessings. Jazakumullah khair wa sallallahu wa sallam 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 wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.